Please welcome a band that needs no introduction, but fucking gets one anyway. From Hollywood, Guns and Roses. During the first recordings of the Use Your Illusion albums, the drummer Steven Adler was forced to leave the band. His addiction to heroin and cocaine was spiraling out of control. Apparently, he could barely record his drum tracks. We're in the studio right now at the present moment as we speak. Oh, it's, it's so exciting. It, it sounds great. The songs are coming together, and we're just we're looking forward to getting it out. Any prognosis as of when? March, April, summer, fall? When? No, you know, you know my band. <laughs> you know, we're unpredictable. God knows what's going to happen. When you get fired from Guns N' Roses for doing too many drugs, you know it's time to, to maybe curb your drug usage. They kicked me out of band because I was doing drugs with them. And then they just brought Matt in and to do drugs with him, too. It wasn't like, was like Matt was sober, he was doing drugs with them. Such a terrible time in my life. Man, it was like being in a courtroom, and you got these lawyers, and they're saying this shit, your bandmates, the people you grew up with are saying shit about you, and then you have to say this about them. It was, it was just so hard. I would bring heroin on the foil to court with me, Every chance I get, I go in the bath and I smoke. I go, I can't do this anymore. And just, I mean, I think I cried for a year straight. I tried to kill myself a few times and it didn't work. There was two separate occasions. I took a uh, hundred Valiums. I drank a, a big bottle of Jägermeister and shot up three fourths of a gram of heroin. We all managed to sort of straighten ourselves out, ex with the exception of Steven. He couldn't play. He was so messed up with junk that he couldn't pull off the tracks. He would lie to us. And we'd go over to his place and find behind the toilet and find stuff underneath the sink. I was so proud, I, you know, to be a part of them, you know, the group and a part of their lives. So that, that's what really hurts because they disappeared. And also I was alone. In 1990, they were trying to make their album and Steven Adler uh, was a heroin addict and he couldn't track the record. He couldn't lay down his drum tracks. Steven was showing up, nodding out, and he wasn't able to perform his part. Well, how come, uh, come Steven left the band at this critical juncture? Steven didn't leave the band. Or how come you and Steven was fired? The 28-year-old, who admits to still taking heroin, was kicked out of the group after signing a document that gave him 30 days to clean up his act. We gave him every ultimatum. We tried working with other drummers. We had Steven sign a contract saying if he went back to drugs, then he was out. Um, he couldn't leave his drugs. It was shocking to me when they fired Steven for a heroin problem because, you know, during the days that they were living with me, Steven was possibly the straightest one of the band. We're in the studio, right. 35 songs. We are writing 24 songs. Uh, basic. 35. 35 we got, 24 we're doing. Yeah, it's a double yeah. album. As far as you know. Title? <laughs> I think it's how you <laughs> the world. <laughs> You had two alternatives. You could either be kicked out of the band then and there, or you could sign the document and agree to go on probation, correct? Yes. Steven Adler's last performance with the band was on April 7th, 1990. Guns and Roses! Ah! The departure of Guns N' Roses hurt me more than I, I think anything has ever hurt me in my whole 27 years. I mean, those were my friends, my family. They, they meant everything to me. Um, I miss them more than I'm upset with them for what they did, but I wish the best for them. Steven Adler was the first original member to leave the band. After his departure in July 1990, Adler would be replaced by the drummer of the cult, Matt Sorum. Well, what happened was um, I was playing with the cult, and I was at the Universal Amphitheater in Los Angeles, and uh, Slash and Duff came down to a show. I was uh, really up against the wall, and, and we needed to find somebody. I started thinking about who's the best drummer that I'd seen in a band 
uh, ever. <laughs> yeah. So about two weeks after the Cold Tour finished, I got a call from Slash saying, uh, you know, we really dug the way you played at the show, and uh, we'd like you to come down and, and do our record. I said, well, what's happened with Steven Adler? Uh, they said, well, we decided to let him go. We want to get a new drummer. And Steven was still in the band. He couldn't play certain songs. Then we got a new drummer, and, and we could have played him, you know. As soon as a couple weeks of rehearsals went by, uh, I went to a barbecue at Slashes, and he proposed a question to me. You want to join Guns N' Roses, you know? Matt proved to be the drummer for the band just by his presence, you know. The first live show was Guns N' Roses was rock and real. <laughs> you know, I mean, I would be like completely lying and ridiculous if I said I wasn't nervous for that. Yeah. This is Matt Sorm, our new drummer. Hello, folks. My pally pal, rhythm section. He did the whole record, if anybody wants to know. And, uh... Albums being mixed, and off we go to Rio. First live gig with Matt playing drums. It was my first show with Axel singing, because uh -huh. uh, he doesn't like to rehearse. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I met him basically at the show and said, Hi, how are you doing? And he came on and we played the show, and yeah, I was nervous. <laughs> yeah, he did. He has saved the band's life. He came in, he's in the up mood, he works, he writes his own material. He writes a lot, he works real well with us. Um, he takes suggestions well, he keeps everybody in line, keeps the timing great. Yeah, you know, I mean, he, he played 29 songs in a month. Guns N' Roses went out on the road with their new drummer, Matt Sorum, even before Use Your Illusion came out. They stayed on the road for three years. Um, it might be called Use Your Illusion. We're talking with an artist named Kastavi because I bought a painting and uh, we want to use this as a possible cover and the, and the title of the painting is Use Your Illusion and that's what, what we may uh, use. I wrote a song the night before that said something I bought, I bought me an illusion and put it on a wall. The next day I found a painting called Use Your Illusion. Yeah, On September 17, 1991, Guns N' Roses released Use Your Illusion 1 and 2. According to a New York Times article, the two albums sold 500,000 copies in the first two hours of their release. I'm Kurt Loder with MTV News. Guns N' Roses' two new Use Your Illusion albums will make history on Monday by entering the Billboard album chart together. There's been a lot of anticipation. I can't remember a record that's had this much uh, a buzz about it before it came out. It makes for a lot of excitement around here. I love hearing new material, it's great, it's just, it's something new, it's something different. People weren't really familiar with it, but I think once they get accustomed to it and get used to it, I think they'll like it a lot. World Tour. They're going to be coming soon to a town near you. There are some tour dates. If you can't catch them this time around, they'll be tearing up the country most of the summer, then heading over to Europe, and they'll be back a little later in the year for four U.S. dates. One way or another, to try to catch them. Unfortunately, the tour began to fall apart by Axel's onstage behavior, as well as late starts. Even when they were playing in the clubs, he would show up late, you know. We played with them at Nassau Coliseum, and we opened up, and uh, we were only booked for a 45-minute show. And uh, at the end of the set, Guns N' Roses managers looking at us going, keep going, keep going. I go, we did all our songs. We only got two records. We're up there for two hours, and the crowd doesn't know what's going on. We come off stage finally, and Axel's not even in the building. By midnight, he's still not there. Everybody's freaking out. The whole place is almost falling down. He's not even in the building. And I look down the hallway, and there's this big commotion going on. And I look, and it's Stephanie Seymour, the model, holding hands with Axel, and he's walking down the hall like nothing happened. And I go, dude, where were you? He goes, I was taking a shower. <laughs> At this point, GNR was the biggest band of the 90s. They started to sell out shows all over Europe, but one particular member of the group had had enough of the drama, late starts, and onstage riots provoked by Axel. 
After years of alcohol and drugs, founding member Izzy Stradlin became sober and began questioning whether or not he wanted to continue like this. He decides to quit the band. When Izzy left the band, it was a big deal, you know, at least as far as I was concerned. I mean, but, you know, he didn't tour with us anyway. We took a jet and he had his own tour bus. Well, I had a bus and they had a plane and I beat him <laughs> to the gig. And uh, so he would tow a trailer with his motorcycles and everything so he could go riding and have fun. He, he, want, he loves to travel because he's a big map guy too. So, you know, like wherever we were, he would just meet up with us. We'd fly in, he'd drive in. So, but I saw, started seeing a split then. To the point where you're like, you know, do I, am I going to carry on like this or, or am I not, you know? And I said, I'm not. I don't think Izzy ever wanted the band to get that big. Izzy's the type of guy that he would have been very happy just staying in the clubs. Izzy called me up and called Duff and everybody and said he's quitting the band. I said, well, can you at least finish the tour? We only got one more gig. That's Wembley Stadium. You know, it's sold out, 72,000 people. And Izzy played and then he, that was it, he left. He didn't want to do it at all. He had enough. He, did, he, was, he had enough with the waiting three hours for Axel to go on stage and the band is ready, everybody's drunk, so and Izzy wasn't drinking, so coffee and tea is not going to keep you happy for long. And the fun part of it was getting lost. I don't think that Izzy ever got the credit for what he put in songwriting wise. So, you know, you take away that little piece of the magic and then, you know, they fired Steven and, you know, there's another piece that goes away. <laughs> Founding Guns N' Roses guitarist Izzy Stradlin has resurfaced after leaving the band last November with a debut solo album called Izzy Stradlin and the Juju Hounds. Do you like the idea of being like a front man, like all the focus in a band being on you? Well, I mean, it was, you know, it's nothing I planned or really had inspiration to do, but at the same time, it's like, you know, why not? It's like, you know, what are you going to do? I mean, and especially, I mean, after being a band with Axel, it's like, who am I going to get, you know? Because <laughs> he decided he wanted to leave and go do his own thing. And uh, we had like two weeks to find somebody. Just weeks before GNR hits the road again, Slash calls guitarist Gilby Clark. He and Matt knew each other from the club days back in the 80s. Gilby always knew that nothing lasts forever. It's just, you know, here, learn the songs, play the songs, here's your paycheck. I knew from day one that it could end tomorrow. So I called him up, and he was the only guy that we physically auditioned. I had two weeks to learn like 40 plus songs, <laughs> two weeks. So it's like I didn't have any time to think about anything, you know? Izzy and I are from the same school. We all kind of like the same kind of music, so I think that's one of the things that, the reason why I'm doing it is because there was a certain style that they wanted, and that was what I played. On July 17, 1992, Guns N' Roses reunited with their friends Metallica to do a North American tour. I mean, it came together so effortless because it was just something that we both wanted and something that was greater than either of us separately and, and it had never really been done. You know, you get the two biggest bands at the time in, in North America each playing full headline sets and we each had our own staging, we each had our own Hoopla and Yahoo and all that stuff and that was um, obviously something that was unprecedented. Now we take you on stage and backstage at the seven and a half hour kickoff show by GNR, Metallica and Faith No More. This is your first time playing with Guns, isn't it? No, we played with Guns N' Roses before as well. So this is kind of like an old friend thing, sort of? Absolutely not. Are there any cities that you're really looking forward to playing? New Orleans. Just New, New Orleans is... Play there. Oh, you've never played there? Well, we have, but you know, a long time ago, I guess. Because New Orleans is a pretty sick place. Sick? I mean that in a good way. What do you mean by that? Have you been to New Orleans? Don't you think New Orleans has got like a certain vibe to it? I mean, I hate saying that word because it sounds kind of weird. No, I think but it's a beautiful it, city. I think you've watched too many movies. How's everything going? Because I imagine that there's a lot of things that you kind of have to work out, especially this being the first show of the tour. Is everything going pretty smooth? Well, we'll find out once you walk out on stage. <laughs> On the eighth show of the tour, both bands played at the Olympic Stadium in Montreal, Canada. During the Metallica set, frontman James Hetfield is confused as to where he should be on stage and suddenly gets burned by a pyrotechnic blast. 
During Fade to Black, I'm up there playing the part, and these colored flames are going off. I'm a little confused on where I should be. The pyro guy doesn't see me that I've walked back out there. A big colored flame goes right up under me. There was an incident with uh, the pyrotechnics. Unfortunately, James uh, is on his way to the hospital right now, and we're very sorry, but we can't continue the concert for you guys tonight. We will come back and finish our concert and play again for you as soon as we can within the next couple of months. Thank you, Montreal. We're sorry, okay? Several hours later, GNR finally takes the stage, but they're having technical difficulties, especially Axel. He could have been the hero of the day, you know? We continue the show and, you know, the band plays on and we're here to bring music and he throws this fit. Axel's monitor system wasn't to his liking. Then the storm two of the evening kind of happened. He'd said something into the mic and just threw it down and walked off stage. Axel didn't want to be outdone. And so we went into the dressing room, you know, and they are acting like nothing happened. Axel's down there with the cigarette holder in one hand and the champagne glass in the other. My voice is giving me trouble. <laughs> Your voice is giving me trouble. You shouldn't probably be drinking or smoking. We couldn't relate to Axel and his attitude, you know? We learned a lot that summer. We learned what not to do as a rock band. What happened then? I mean, you, you got out there and we got out there you the, played the, anyway. The PA fed back the entire time. The monitors fed back the entire time. All we need is just a little patient and a really good monitor man. We had just stopped the tour because I had throat problems. Came back and I realized I'm going to hurt myself. Right. I told Slash two more songs. If it's not, if we can't get it fixed, I got to go. You know. And then we did more than two more songs. And finally, I was just kind of like, I don't know what to do. And I looked over and Gilby was like, Dude, I can't hear. And Duff was like, I can't hear either. Yeah, and we had a person. little, we had a little huddle kind of, and was like, We're out of here. His voice was messed up. He just couldn't hear himself. And. Uh, chose to leave. I went out to the stage and, you know, they're shredding the place there. You know, I saw bonfires and this is an enclosed stadium and they just looted everything. There were cop cars overturned and, I mean, I've never seen anything like, you know, that was my first riot. That was a really sort of embarrassing moment for everybody. It was like, you know, we have no control over this. What's the scariest moment you ever had on stage? We were in Santiago, Chile. And I remember we played in the, where they had Amnesty International. During the military coup, about 20,000 people were murdered in that stadium. We're playing at that same stadium where those people are actually buried in and around that stadium, in the ground. So no one, no one had told Axel that piece of information. And I remember him going, I, I don't want to fucking play here. And then the military was the security there. The chief of police or whoever he was said, we will use force if you don't do the show. He said, what kind of force? If Axel leaves the stage early, we will shoot and kill him. <laughs> he said it in Spanish, maybe he fucked up the way it came out. Axel was in rare form. Perfect set, perfect time, good show. He did a great show that day. It was fucking perfect. It was. <laughs> I said, Doug, you need to tell Axel that part because he needs to know. <laughs> During the Skin and Bones tour in 1993, guitarist Gilby Clark broke his wrist in a motorcycle accident. The band decided to call Izzy Stradlin to fill in for a couple of gigs. These were his final shows with GNR. How do you feel the tour has changed over the last couple of years? Well, right now we don't have that big band that we were carrying around before. So, and we're doing an acoustic set, that's a big difference. The thing is, is like we did the show in Israel the other night, and Izzy was playing with us because Gilby broke his wrist. So that was interesting in itself. I think we're one of the first stadium bands who's replaced their replacement with their original guitar player. It's okay, I mean, he's forgotten a few of the songs. But, you know, it's all right, you know. You know, like, people know that he hasn't played with us for over two years, so. And basically had no idea what the set was like, and we didn't know what he was going to be like, and it was all pretty much spontaneous. In an interview with Louder Sound magazine, Izzy Stradlin said, 
They were all fucked up. They didn't even recognize me. It was really bizarre. It was like playing with zombies. It was just horrible. Nobody was laughing anymore. Izzy's just not interested in this business anymore, you know. And uh, it was because of this dramatic uh, effect that success had on everybody's personal psyche, you know. The actual original member is sort of um, depleting over, over years and a lot of reasons for that happening and so on. And we kept ourselves going on a tour that, that went for two plus years. The Use Your Illusion tour got very, very bloated. Axel had taken on psychotherapists on tour with him. He had spiritual advisors. A lady called Sharon Maynard, whose nickname on the tour was Yoda. Axel goes to Yoda and has to get her approval over the plans. Now suddenly we can't play Texas because uh, the sun is in the wrong section of the sky. And, and, and Yoda has said there's bad energy, and Axel, you, you mustn't leave the room that day. To me, it got a little ridiculous. And then, and then there was even more people added to the stage. For me, the biggest change in Guns N' Roses, I think, was the video when Axel decided that they needed an aircraft carrier, and he's going to jump over an aircraft carrier and swim with dolphins. OK, <laughs> that was the part that I said, you know what, that's not so street. And that's where we just sort of completely separated. This group of guys is here, and this other guy's on this page. It, it got so big, the machine was so big, and I felt pushed along by this, you know, 25 Mack trucks that wouldn't stop. And there was no way out. We couldn't go and play theaters. And we couldn't, but the band was too big. The high point uh, for me on Use Your Illusion Tour, ending it, <laughs> it was so long. On July 17, 1993, Guns N' Roses play their last show in Buenos Aires, Argentina. The band also completes the longest tour in rock history. They already knew that the band was falling apart. Individually, each band member started to work on other musical projects and collaborations with other artists. Nobody wanted to come home, you know, nobody really wanted to end because I think everybody in the back of their mind thought that it was going to be over. In October of 1996, Slash leaves the band followed by Matt and Duff. Slash has been focused on his new project, Slash's Snake Pit. Meanwhile, Axl Rose keeps the band's name and hasn't spoken with Slash ever since. I think one of the problems that, that happened towards the end of the Guns N' Roses thing was even the getting on stage part um, was made difficult. Yeah. And then it, it, it started to become not so much fun. What was really nice about uh, playing with the guys is um, there's a lot of aggression in, in their music. And, and once again, it is simple. It is like, you know, rock, but maybe it's hard rock, you know, but... Um, I, I like the way that they approached it. It was just very aggressive, and it was the way that I've always wanted to you know, make records and play live. When Duff and I quit, there was a question as to, well, who wants to deal with the name? Listen, me and Duff were like, we don't want it. What are we going to do with it, you know? And Axel chose to keep the name and go on and, and promote it as such, so. At one point, it was like, it's not a solo project, it's a side project. Now it's like, it's just another band. But I think I've accumulated enough experience over the years that I can get away with doing it. With Guns N' Roses, the band got so big, it's like, where do you go from there? So this is fun just to get back down right. to sort of like a, a roots kind of thing and just go out and play some clubs, you know? <laughs> People were calling saying, oh, it's on the, it's on the um, internet, it's on, in Variety, that Guns in, is back together to play or some, yeah, some blown up. And that's just like so far away from anything that, that's true, you know. No matter how much money they stick in our face, there's no reason for us to get together to do anything unless we have some sort of mutual understanding or respect. And we're way, way far from that, so I don't see it in any time in the foreseeable future. 
Axl Rose disappears for several years trying to reform Guns N' Roses and make a new album with new members. But on January 1st, 2001, the House of Blues in Las Vegas seems to be the new opportunity for Axl to show fans what he's been working on all these years. The new lineup is ready for their live show debut, but Axl is the only original member of the band. Millions of fans across the world and the media already know that the new GNR album is called Chinese Democracy, but it's not ready to be released and hasn't been finished yet. The work in progress has been cataloged by the media as one of the most expensive albums ever made in music history. The New York Times reported it as the most expensive record ever recorded. I don't know how that's going to come off, but he seems to know what he's doing. It's taken him a while, but... Uh... I hope, it, I hope it works out for him. I hope he gets the record out, and you know, and there's some pretty heavy people at the helm right now working on on the Guns record. So I don't think anybody's fucking around because I think too much too much money and time has been spent. You know, say so they have to do. It. As for Slash, Matt, and Duff, they formed the supergroup Velvet Revolver with singer of Stone Temple Pilots Scott Weiland. I've been in enough bands and done enough sessions and played enough gigs. After all these years now, I do understand what it is. And to finally have that come around a second time is a real blessing. Finally, Chinese Democracy is released in November of 2008. Slash has some thoughts about it. And it's got some good stuff on it. It's, I mean, you know, I think it's almost a cliche now, but uh, we always say it's just great. He's got a great voice, and it's great to hear his voice. The rest of it um, is it is what it is, but it's, it's, it's one of those things where you hear his voice and just go out <laughs> I've heard that you made friends with Axel Rose again. How was that possible after all those years? Yeah, it was it was it was probably way overdue, you know, but uh, um, it's 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 you know, it's very cool at this point, you know, let some of that, that uh, sort of negative dispel some of that negative stuff that was going on for so long. I text Fernando and, and asked for uh, Slash's number, and then Fernando texts his mom and he's like, if this is a joke, <laughs> I'm going to kill you. On April 1st, 2016, GNR finally reunite to play a gig at the Troubadour, the same club that Guns N' Roses used to play in back in the 80s. I think we should do something. Axel slash talking to you. <laughs> Steven Adler did join Guns N' Roses for a couple of shows in the Not In This Lifetime tour, but the band just let him play a few songs. He's not part of the stable lineup to this day. GNR has officially announced that they will be playing and touring again in 2021. Who knows who might rejoin the band this time around? I know in this life, you don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen next month in my life. 